Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history with Liz Covart. The study of history is key to understanding who we are and how we can affect a better future. Ben Franklin's World will introduce you to historical people and events that have impacted and shaped our present day world. And now, here's your host, Liz Covart. Hello, and welcome to episode 11 of Ben Franklin's World the podcast dedicated to helping you learn more about how the people and events of our early American past have shaped the present-day world we live in. Each week, we sit down with an historian to discuss their unique insights into our early American past so we can learn more about who we are and how we can affect a better future. Philadelphia, Pennsylvania plays host to many historic sites associated with our early American history. Carpenters Hall, Independence Hall, and the Betsy Ross House are but a few of its historic holdings. But do you know about the Woodlands? This historic site lays just three miles from Independence Hall. Although it did not play a prominent role in the American Revolution, the Woodlands and its founder, William Hamilton, played an important role in the architectural and botanical development of Philadelphia and the young United States. In today's episode, Jessica Baumert, Executive Director of the Woodlands Historic Site, will guide us through the Woodlands and its history. Jessica will reveal what the Woodlands Historic Site is and what you can expect to find there when you visit, who William Hamilton was, and how he came to develop this unique architectural and botanical estate between 1766 and 1813, and what role Hamilton and the Woodlands played in the Lewis and Clark Expedition. And for a bit of fun, Jessica will also unveil the secrets of the Woodlands' secret passageways and how they were used. But first, if you haven't done so already, would you please rate this podcast? Your rating will help us keep Ben Franklin's World visible and findable for new people. To rate and review Ben Franklin's World, a podcast about early American history, just visit benfranklinsworld.com slash iTunes or benfranklinsworld.com slash Stitcher. With tidings and wisdom to share about our early American past, here is this week's special guest. Today we welcome Jessica Baumert, the Executive Director of the Woodlands Historic Site in West Philadelphia. Jessica has a background in both architectural preservation and cultural landscapes. She also has extensive experience working with historic cemeteries. After receiving her degree from the Savannah College of Art and Design, Jessica went on to work in the James Madison Family Cemetery in Montpelier, Virginia, and the Colonial Park Cemetery in Savannah, Georgia. Welcome to Ben Franklin's World, Jessica. Thank you for having me. So I couldn't help but notice when I looked at your resume that you have the James Madison Family Cemetery, the Colonial Park Cemetery, and now the Woodland Cemetery listed on that document. So how did you become fascinated in historic cemeteries? Well, it was it was really an accident. When I was when I was studying in Savannah, um I signed up to do an internship um with somebody who does cemetery preservation at Colonial Park Cemetery. And um it it was a great experience and uh, I was asked um to continue to work with him when I graduated, and he really specialized in cemeteries. And that summer, he had um, the contract to do the restoration of the James Madison Cemetery. Um, So um, I just, over the course of time, became really fascinated by cemeteries. Um, They're a great way to learn about people um, and what they were doing in different cities. Every city that I go to now, I Um, always visit their historic cemetery. It's a great way to learn about the people um, that lived in a place Um, and a great way to um, kind of look at the different styles of architecture in miniature form often um, in in cemeteries. Um, I then got away from cemeteries for a while, um, working in Fairmount Park here in Philadelphia, working on a lot of the Schuylkill River villas. Um, And when Um, this opportunity here at the Woodlands um, happened. Um, I live in the neighborhood, and this was one of my favorite places to go on a walk um, to clear my mind. And so here I am. So we're going to talk a lot about the Woodlands, but just one more question about the cemeteries. When you walk into a historic cemetery, what do you look for to help you better understand the history and the people that are 
Well, you know, you can look at, um, you can tell a lot by people's names, um, kind of what um, nationality maybe they were, or you can tell a lot by what age, by different time periods, by how old people were when they died. Um, You know, a lot of cemeteries, you'll see a lot of older cemeteries, you'll see a lot of infant deaths or young deaths. You can see a lot about medical history and how that changed over time and how long people were living. Um, You can tell um, when different disease outbreaks had had an impact on society. Um, So there's, there's that from the actual written words on the headstones. But then there's also huge monuments in some cemeteries, especially cemeteries, the era that the Woodlands Cemetery is, um, you know, very large mausoleums, people showing off their wealth, um, oftentimes symbolism on headstones that indicates what their profession was. Um, so there's so many different, everything from symbolism to death dates to last names and, and where people came from, um, um, you can find out. It sounds like if we really pay attention when we walk in, we have a lot of primary sources to tell us um, about the history. Just if we keep our eyes open, we can't miss it. Right. Absolutely. So the Woodlands is a rich historic site that encompasses 54 acres along the Schuylkill River. Can you tell us about the Woodlands and what we can expect to find when we venture to West Philadelphia? So the Woodlands is a really interesting site. Um, We've talked a little bit so far about the cemetery aspect of the site, but the history of the woodlands is much older than that. Um, And um, before it was a cemetery, it was the estate of William Hamilton. Um, And Hamilton um, was from a family of wealthy politicians and lawyers. um, And he inherits 350 acres when he's three years old, basically, um, and and is very wealthy, owns a lot of land, and when he comes of age, decides to make the Woodlands his permanent estate where he builds a, a villa, house, he builds a stable, he builds a massive greenhouse, and he um, explores and his um, passion for botany um, and and has a lot of botanical introductions on the property. So it becomes this amazing um, 18th century estate that many people um, in the 18th century made a point to visit because it was a really unique place. Um, at the greatest extent, the site was 600 acres. Wow. Um, and he really owned all of the land that University of Pennsylvania now sits on, that Drexel University now sits on, and you can see remnants of his estate throughout the West Philadelphia neighborhood. Um, Hamilton Walk is is a walkway on Penn's campus, for instance. Um, There's a lot of um, street names and uh, remnants of his kind of botanical endeavors throughout the area um, that you can still find. So when you walk into the estate, when you walk into the woodlands today, you first feel like you're walking into a 19th century cemetery, but as you continue to explore, you come upon this 18th century house, and we've got these great layers of history. Um, In addition to that, today, we really act like a park for the neighborhood. So we have a lot of runners that come running here. We have a big dog walking community, and we have a lot of people that just uh, use this space to escape the busy city. You can walk in our gates and really suddenly feel like you have walked into a totally different dimension. Wow, a site with historical memory, uh, recreation, and history. Uh, That's pretty neat. Yes, absolutely. You mentioned that Hamilton uh, built his first house when he was young in the 1760s. But in 1786, he decided to rebuild his home in the Adam or Federal style. Would you help us paint a picture in our minds about what each of those architectural styles look like? First, his classical designed house of the 1760s, and second, his Adams or Federal style home. And then tell us why Hamilton chose to renovate his estate after the Revolution. Yes. So Hamilton, Hamilton, when he comes of age in 1766, decides he's going to build his permanent home here at the Woodlands. Um, He 
immediately starts construction and by 1770 has constructed the first version of the house. Um, the first version of the house was uh, very kind of Georgian in style. It was a lot, uh, had a lot more um, square corners and angles um, that were 90 degree angles. Um, and he did build a two story portico on the south side of the building at that point in time. The building at that point was um, not terribly large, although it had a fairly grand presence on, on the estate with the two story portico. Um, he kind of continues to make improvements to the house through the 1770s. He's kind of a, um, throughout his lifetime, he doesn't really leave anything alone for very long. He's constantly experimenting um, with his house, with his his garden. Um, so you see small changes happen throughout the 1770s. Um, after the Revolutionary War, Hamilton is, this is a side note, but he's tried for treason during the Revolutionary War. He's not convicted, but he really doesn't like the impact that the war has had on his lifestyle. And he travels to England in the 1780s, um, early 1780s to take care of some business, um, and also to kind of escape escape all of the upheaval related to the revolution. Uh, while he's there, he kind of goes on his own personal grand tour of England. He, We don't know exactly where he went. Um, we still have a lot of research to do on this aspect uh, of Hamilton's life. But we do know that he um, visited various estates, um, country estates around London, and he was getting inspiration for his estate back here in Philadelphia. Uh, while he was there, he's writing letters back to his secretary, asking for lengths of pieces of furniture and sending back information on things he's seeing there that he wants to implement upon his return to Philadelphia at the Woodlands. Uh, we don't know if he spoke directly to architects when he was there. Um, what we do know is that while he was there, he was purchasing Sir John Soane's books um, on architecture, um, which came back here to Philadelphia with him and were in his, his library. Um, we also, you know, have a lot of um, examples of contemporary architecture in England that we often use to compare the Woodlands to. Um, so Hamilton then comes back to Philadelphia in 1786 and immediately starts basically reconstructing his house. The portico stays, and while the, f the floor plan of the initial Georgian house, the actual floor you're standing on, still exists today, he reconfigures the, spa the interior spaces significantly, and he adds on these two amazing wings to the house. And really, when you look at a floor plan today, it's, it's hard to tell that it was built in phases because it v feels like a very unified building. This new 1776 to 1789 is the time frame that this this reconstruction happened um, is very different than the first. He he raises the ceilings and creates these grand entertaining spaces. He adds we have multiple elliptical rooms. Um, we have symmetry is, is key, and we see a lot of very kind of classical ornamentation and elements added to the the building. Um, so those are kind of generally um, the changes that he made at that point in time. So the picture I'm painting in my mind is a is a big house. That's, that is symmetrical. So if it has four windows on one side, it has four windows on the other, which would be very Georgian. But then to add the Federalist or Adams style, I'm thinking delicate features. So did he have elaborate molding, um, you know, with like fine ivy or something um, engraved? He in had, it? so he adds Palladian windows. He adds, um, he does add some detailed molding work um, with, um, we've got, 
you know, above the door frame, we have sphinxes, and then we've got some kind of decorative carving in the door frames that are um, garlands of uh, flower garlands, again, very symmetrical. So he adds this type of ornamentation. He does not add a lot of ceiling ornamentation, as you would have seen in England at the time. There's not... It's not an extreme level of plaster work. What he does do, and we have lost a lot of this over the course of time, but he, French wallpaper, French wallpaper on the interior of many of the rooms. Um, that's, that's very busy, classical themed, uh, wallpaper, um, wall coverings. So, so he does add this kind of very, kind of classical element to the property at that point in time. Boy, it sounds like he spared no expense. He spared no expense. And I'm just curious, the way I understand it, and maybe you can tell me if this is correct or not, Adam's style is what they refer to the style in England, but we in America call it Federalist, uh, because, you know, after the Revolution, we have issues. Would Hamilton have also called it Adam, or would he have called it Federalist? I really don't know what they would have called it at that point. I don't know what Hamilton would have called it at that point in time. What I do know is that because Hamilton brought this style basically back directly from England, it's it's really difficult to come up with any examples of this style of architecture that are earlier than the woodlands in North America. So it makes the woodlands really significant. Um, you know, I, I always hesitate in saying that it's the earliest example, but I have yet to come up with an example um, of this style of architecture to the level that it is in this in North America. Um, so it was very, very avant-garde for this country at the time that he built it. So if we come to the woodlands, we're going to see a really unique house. And another unique feature that I understand that he installed was something called a cryptoporticus. Jessica, could you tell us what a cryptoporticus is and can we see it when we visit? Yes. So the cryptoporticus um, is uh, comes from a Roman word. And the Roman definition of the word um, very much relates to what it's used for here at the Woodlands. Um, and again, this goes back to the name Cryptoporticus, going back to kind of this classical era, again, fits with Hamilton's general vision for this place. Um, in ancient Rome, architecture with a Cryptoporticus means a covered corridor or passageway. So Hamilton created this covered passageway on the north entrance to the mansion. So when you walk up the steps on the north entrance, you walk onto a terrace. Below that terrace is this covered passageway. The passageway was used as a way for servants to move around the building uh, without impacting a visitor's experience, going unnoticed. So all of the servant spaces in the woodlands are on the the basement level. Um, and the kitchen is below the dining room, and everything's fairly logical based on where the rooms are in the house. But the kitchen has a door that goes out into the cryptoporticus. Um, so all of the rooms on that north side of the building have do- from the basement have doors that go into the cryptoporticus so that the servants could really circulate around the house while going unnoticed to visitors um, while Hamilton was entertaining. Um, there are references that indicate that the cryptoporticus also led into a kind of a sunken passageway that went to the stable block and to the greenhouse area of the site so that the servants would not interrupt the landscape while they were going back and forth on the property. So there, there were a lot of things put in place here at the mansion to hide the servants and to allow them to circulate throughout the household without interrupting other activities here. Wow. Hidden passages. It's like from every childhood's dream. Yeah. Now, when you say servants, did Hamilton employ servants or did he have slaves that he's trying to keep out of view? Well, this is something we're actually really trying to learn a lot about. We do not believe he had slaves. There's no indication that he had slaves. Um, we know a f- we know about a few of his servants more than others. He had clearly had house servants. He had um, people that worked in his stable, and we know that 
uh, one of his servants, whose name was George Hilton, who was a black man, um, who was an indentured servant, becoming a paid servant over time, ends up in Hamilton's lifetime uh, becoming one of his head gardeners. Uh, so this was probably Hamilton's, the most important job on Hamilton's estate, knowing how much he loved botany and gardening. So to entrust this individual, George Hilton, with, with this task uh, means that he would have had quite a bit of respect for his abilities. Um, George Hilton also traveled to England um, to pick up kind of precious plant specimens for William Hamilton. Um, so, so George Hilton is somebody that we know more about than a lot of his other servants, but we still would really like to learn more about George Hilton and, and what his role was on the estate. Um, so something that we still are learning about, but that we really hope we can learn more about um, you know, through, through research over the course of the next few years. Now, Hamilton was an eminent botanist and plant collector. Jessica, what influence did Hamilton's interests in botany play in how he developed the landscape of his large estate? It played a very big role. So no longer existing on the property, but built at the same time as the mansion expansion happened, was a massive greenhouse, Um, Hamilton's greenhouse. There are accounts of it having 9,000 different plants in it. Um, People would visit here and say that every plant that they could ever imagine seeing from every region of the world was represented in Hamilton's greenhouse. Um, So, you know, for its time, it was one of the most significant greenhouses in the country. Um, Hamilton introduces numerous tree and plant species to North America here on the property, and he clearly um, likes to show these off. So placement on in the landscape is key. In the same way, he brings back this style of architecture from England. He also, while while he's in England, is looking at the different ways that landscape is developing in England, and he's um, inspired by the kind of capability brown aesthetic um, of having a, a park garden. So his 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 garden from the south side of the mansion down to the river was very park-like. It was um, looked natural, even though everything was, was very planned. Um, and he um, planted these rare specimens in places where people could see them and they would be um, intrigued by them and they would want to come visit to see these these new things that he was introducing to this country. So, Definitely, um, he was manipulating his landscape. He was constantly experimenting with his landscape, um, and he was um, influencing um, and trading plants with other prominent Philadelphians and other prominent people in this country and really having a big impact on botanical plant trade in the 18th century. Where is he acquiring all these plants from? You alluded to the fact that he's he's trading some with people in Philadelphia, but where are they getting their plants from? And did Hamilton introduce any plants or tree species that we know into North America? So Hamilton is... Um, I, I wish I was a I wish I was a more skilled or trained botanist so that I could speak to this a little bit better. But uh, Hamilton was, you know, the Woodlands is part of this great Philadelphia corridor. It's, we kind of think of it as a botanical corridor. Bartram's Garden is about a mile down the river, um, and William Bartram and William Hamilton were friends and they traded a lot of plants with each other. Um, William Bartram was uh, was sending a lot of plants through their nursery to England um, and as a result, um, you know, we, we assume that William Hamilton was able to make contacts in part through him. Um, we don't know exactly where in England Hamilton was getting his plants, although we do we speculate a lot, and it's again something we'd like to do more research on. Hamilton introduces the ginkgo tree to North America here at the Woodlands. He imports three uh, seedlings, um, and when we look at the ginkgo tree in England, Kew Botanical Gardens has a heritage ginkgo tree. Um, 
that dates, I believe, to the 1760s sometime. So we can speculate that this may be where uh, Hamilton got his his seedlings from, but we're not entirely sure. So something, again, that we would like to do more research on. Um, Hamilton imports these three trees, though, and he gives one to his friend William Bartram. And we no longer have the original trees here at the Woodlands, but Bartram's garden a mile down the river has the oldest ginkgo tree in North America, which was a gift from William Hamilton to William Bartram. So you can see these kind of um, references to um, Hamilton's botanical contacts throughout Philadelphia. We also know that Hamilton um, corresponded regularly with Thomas Jefferson. Um, There is some correspondence between William Hamilton and George Washington. And most often this correspondence is discussing varying plants that George Washington wants to plant at Mount Vernon, that Thomas Jefferson would like to plant at Monticello, making a request of William Hamilton to please send him if he has available certain certain tree and plant species. So he was a very you know he was very well known at the time for having this great collection. Um, he also Hamilton um, was sent two crates of seeds by Thomas Jefferson from the Lewis and Clark expedition. So oh, cool. um, there was uh, not only did he have a great collection, but there was clearly some confidence in his ability um, to uh, germinate the plants from from the Lewis and Clark expedition and and various other things. So um, you can really see see the impact um, of Hamilton's botanical endeavors throughout. It's also a reason a lot of people came to visit here to see these rare plant species that they had never seen before. What kind of specimens did Lewis and Clark send Hamilton and what role did he play in the study and introduction of those species to north, northeastern United States? We don't know exactly what they sent him. So it's a little bit difficult to um, to answer that question. Um, we do know that um, but unlike a lot of the other people, only only a handful of people got seeds, and William Hamilton's the only one that got two crates of seeds. It's interesting that Hamilton was sent seeds. Um, he's clearly very capable. He wasn't, while he was very capable, he wasn't, he, he was a, he was capable, but he was still a, a, an amateur in a way. You know, he wasn't a professional botanist. Um, And so unlike some scientists that were writing papers on the things that they were discovering, Hamilton was really growing things for his own benefit um, and to kind of uh, increase his social, you know, increase his social standing and raise his social, raise the elevation of his social standing amongst his peers. He wasn't really growing these things to make major discoveries to share with the world. In fact, oftentimes just in reading correspondence, you get the sense that he didn't really want to share them with the world. He wanted people to come to the woodlands and be in awe of them here at his estate. So it's a little hard to answer that question. We don't really know exactly what was in those crates, Um, but um, we do know that he, he was sent two crates. So Wow, it sounds like he used botany to uh, transform his estate into a destination at the time, so people would come. Absolutely, and and between the new style of architecture people could see here, the tree and plant species that were being introduced here, and the way that he was planting them, and the way he collected art here, um, we have many, many accounts of people's visit to this site from the 18th century, And all of them are extremely descriptive and lead you to believe that many people that were visiting here, even people of great prominence, were seeing this style of things for the first time. Um, So it was really had to have been an amazing experience to visit here in the 18th century. So you mentioned that the Woodlands is now part cemetery. I know Hamilton died in 1813. What happened to his estate after his death, and how did it become the Woodland Cemetery? Well, something that's interesting about Hamilton is that he never marries or has children. So, you know, during his lifetime, um, he obviously collects all these things um, and, and builds this grand estate. But upon his death in 1813, he doesn't have any direct descendants to pass them along to. 
So his nieces and nephew uh, inherit the estate, and his nephew works to try to care for it for a few years before his nephew suddenly dies. So over the course of time, and Philadelphia is growing, um, the estate slowly starts to fall into disrepair. But it's still this well-known place. People still know that William Hamilton's Woodlands was this amazing place. Outside parcels of the 600 estates start getting sold off. And over time, there were varying plans to build coal wharfs on the river where his estate is. And there were all of these kind of, you know, Philadelphia was industrializing at that point in time. And in 1840, a group of men get together and decide that they would like to start a rural cemetery on the core 90 acres of his estate. Um, This was an interesting idea at the time in Philadelphia, Laurel Hill Cemetery, which is also a rural landscape cemetery in the same style as the Woodlands, was founded in 1838, so two years prior to the Woodlands Cemetery. And the Woodlands already had these meandering pathways and amazing trees and botanical specimens and all these things that really made the rural landscape cemetery movement what it is. So it kind of had had these features pre-built into the landscape for the cemetery company. Um, One of the things that I always think is is really incredible about the cemetery company um, and the cemetery founding the site that without the cemetery company finding, founding the site, we probably would not have any of the Hamilton estate left. Likely would have been industrialized like the other side of the river was, or would have become row homes, or a combination of the two. So the cemetery company purchasing and founding the cemetery on the property is really what saves the Hamilton legacy. Another thing that I always find really forward thinking um, for the time is in, is the Articles of Incorporation of the Woodland Cemetery Company. Um, they, um, I'm going to read a line from the Articles of Incorporation um, that we really use today in our own interpretation of what we do. Um, and so the this line from the Cemetery Company minutes or from the Cemetery Company Articles of Incorporation reads whereby the beautiful landscape and scenery of that situation, Hamilton's estate, may be perpetually preserved and its ample space for the free circulation of air and groves of trees afford a security against encroachments upon the dead and health and solace upon the living. So it's a very, um, to, to think of 1840 and to think of people being that preservation minded, um, but also being able to connect the Hamilton story to the to the cemetery story to our story today is a pretty incredible thing. And I know that during that period, because we have them in Boston, people thought of cemeteries, rural cemeteries, as recreational areas, place that you could go and have a picnic, you know, a green space. And today, the Woodlands has a mission to enrich the lives of area residents and visitors by serving as a hub of activities and educational programs. So you can still today use it as a as a recreational type place. Uh, space, and as well as a reflective type of space. What types of programs and activities does the Woodlands put on to fulfill its mission? Well, we do all kinds of things. We do everything from we have craft festivals on the property. We have a series of programming for neighborhood families in the summer called Nature Nights. We have Firefly Night, Moth Night. Um, and we're able to tie a lot of these kind of very casual, fun, free activities to our history because we've got so many famous people buried here. We've got, you know, from a, for these nature nights, we've got lots of naturalists buried here. We've got Ezra Cresson, who was the founder of the American Entomological Society, buried here. So when we have these types of events, you know, it's a great way for families to come to an open space that are normally in a dense urban environment, let their kids run around, catch fireflies, and we're able to tie it back to varying parts of our history um, or stories about people that are that are what we call our permanent residents. Um, We also do, um, you know, we do everything from those types of casual family activities to um, we'll have lecture series on occasion. Um, We try to get 
students. We have a lot of student involvement here at the Woodlands. We've got a great relationship with Penn, who does a lot of research projects. Um, last spring, we did a project with Villanova. Um, it's public history department. They did a practicum on the servants' lives at the a great um, program called Old House New Discoveries. Uh, we're often, it, because we still have so much research to do, we're finding new things out all the time. So we're trying to have an annual event, which is really um, us sharing with the public all of the new things that we found this past year. Um, so we really do a wide variety. We're talking about doing a fun run, um, both as a fundraiser, but also um, just to really engage our passive audience because we've got a lot of runners and people that we're trying to engage more in the history of the site. So. That sounds like a lot of fun and education all wrapped in. Absolutely. So we just have a few minutes left, which means it is time for the time warp. The time warp. Historians can't predict the future, but they can speculate about what might have been. This is a fun segment of the show where we ask you a hypothetical history question about what might have happened if something had occurred differently or if someone had acted differently. So, Jessica, are you ready for the time warp? I think I'm ready. Okay. The writer of William Hamilton's 1813 obituary noted that the study of botany was the principal amusement of his life. So, Jessica, in your opinion, what might have happened if William Hamilton had had a different hobby? Would the landscape of West Philadelphia or North America be different? Well, I think it would have been different, and I think it would have had an impact on, definitely on Philadelphia, Um, and as our role in the 18th century as this kind of hub, um, hub of science where things were happening, because I think his role was very important in that. I also think that, you know, his, his, passion for that, his placement of the house, so much of what he was doing here related directly to the landscape. I don't think that this this place would still be here if he wasn't so interested in the landscape. And I think, you know, we forget how tied all those things were together in the 18th century um, and how, um, especially for people of William Hamilton's class. um, But I think I think had he had a different interest, um, he, I don't think that his estate in its form would be what it is. And as a result, I don't think that the, I just don't think this would be here. I think this side of the river could be industrial and, and we wouldn't have this amazing place. So, um, that's my, that's my feeling on it. Well, we can imagine that when we venture out to West Philadelphia of what have happened. He hadn't been so interested. And today, you can kind of feel that on the... Right. So before we conclude, what types of projects, events, or programs does the, Woodland have com- the wo- does the Woodlands have coming up in 2015? Well, we're planning a lot of our sa- similar programs that I talked about earlier, but what we have that's happening right now that's very exciting, we are actually, we started a few weeks ago with the restoration of the crypto porticus and the north terrace um, that structure was um, fairly unstable um, and had a lot of temporary structural supports underneath it but we're working on um, totally restoring it which will make it available to the public which it hasn't really been available for the public to go into and we anticipate that project being done in june of 2015 so we'll be able to open the crypto porticus up for public view Um, which is going to be just incredible. Um, We also are in the midst of fundraising for the rest of the mansion and the stable, the two Hamilton-era buildings, for their exterior preservation. So with any luck and a little bit of um, fundraising, um, I guess fundraising luck, we'll um, we'll have two buildings under restoration um, and they are in, in desperate need of of restoration work so um, we're really hopeful about that and looking forward to it which will then open so many doors for us for further programming and use of the site fantastic june 2015 and we can go down into the crypto particus and all the hidden passages that's right so where is the best place to look for more information about you, the Woodlands, and how we can plan our upcoming visit to West Philadelphia? 
So our website is a great resource, um, and our website is www.woodlandsphila.org. Uh, we also have a very active Facebook page, um, which is just the Woodlands, and we also participate in all the other social media um, outlets, Twitter, Instagram, um, and our um, tag for those is Woodlands Phila. Um, we try to keep all of those things up to date about upcoming activities um, and when the house might be open for special events. The house is only open for tours seasonally, so right now we are not open um, for tours. We'll reopen again in April for tours, but if people are interested in coming on a visit, we do set up um, a tours by appointment in the off season. Um, so that's always an option. But other than that, the gates to the grounds are open 365 days a year from dawn to dusk. Um, so it's a really a great resource. You can come visit and walk the grounds anytime and see so many of the amazing monuments of, of people that have had a huge impact on society who are buried here. Um, and, and we've got um, some resources on our website about kind of locating permanent residents of the site. So, Fantastic. It sounds like you're all over the web, but we will include links to all of your social media networks and your website in the show notes page for this episode. Great. Well, thank you very much for joining us today on Ben Franklin's World, Jessica. Thank you so much for having me, Liz. This was really fun. Unique architecture, a grand estate, historic grounds that offer an escape from the bustling life of Philadelphia, and secret passageways. The Woodlands has a lot to offer history lovers and nearby residents. I just wish we knew what were in those two crates that Lewis and Clark sent Hamilton. Our conversation with Jessica serves as a good reminder that when we visit historic cities, we should take the time to research and visit not only the main historic sites of that city, but its less well-known, but no less historically significant sites too. Because if we don't take this time, we could miss out on seeing and learning about important aspects of our history. You can find more information about Jessica, the Woodlands, plus everything we talked about today on the show notes page for this episode, which you'll find at benfranklinsworld.com slash 011. Finally, I have a question for you. If you could travel through time and visit one place, where would you go and why? Email your answer to Liz at benfranklinsworld.com or tweet me at, at Liz Covart. I can't wait to hear from you. And remember, never leave till tomorrow that which you can do today.